And this morning, our subject was a lot of reminders, really, of stuff we've um, we've looked at before uh, concerning all sorts of questions. So the first thing we saw this morning was realizing that God is big enough for our questions. So people can be afraid to ask God, worried about asking him, um, worried about just what expressing what's on their hearts and what they're, they're really thinking. But God can take it. God's huge. God can handle those questions. We looked at how to approach those questions using the example of Psalms, um, mainly there, which is to come before God respectfully when we ask these things, but just to let them out, to let him know, again, what's on our heart. If we have a question, ask it. One of the most dangerous things we can do is bottle that kind of stuff up inside, because not only can it lead to more doubts and more questions, but it can lead to anger and frustration. Let those things out. We can let other people know in the church. That's part of the reason we're all here together, is to, is to help each other out with those kind of things and to figure those things out together. But we need to also... We listen to what he says to us. We come before him. We ask the question. We ask it respectfully. We ask it wholeheartedly. We ask it actually honestly, like wanting to seek, wanting to seek an answer and being interested in what he has to say. But then we listen to him, and then we live. We keep moving. We keep moving forward. Instead of getting stuck, instead of getting all worried about the question and the things we don't know, move forward in the light of what we do know. And then we end it with kind of laud him or praise him, this idea of, for the things we do, for the things we don't know, give him glory for who he is. And that draws us closer to him. And sometimes that answers those questions. The more we think about how great he is, how good he is, all those things about him, that can a lot of times give us the solutions we're looking for, give us the reminders we're looking for, and help us with that, with that sort of thing and with those struggles. But tonight, we're going to tack on the next natural piece here. Do a little bit of Q&A. So questions and answers for tonight. And that's one thing from this morning's study is the Bible is full of questions. Like nobody in the Bible had problems asking questions. The disciples were constantly peppering Jesus with questions. The prophets in the Old Testament, the forefathers were always asking questions. Psalms, again, that's why we use it as an example, because it's full of questions. So picked up just a few examples tonight to look at, um, giving us a, kind of a, some broad categories. We'll, we'll hit a few things along the way that I think will cover a lot of it because we could be here for a long time if we did a look at, at all of these questions. We'll pick out three and go through them and see what we can find out from the answers that are provided here. So first of all, Exodus chapter 3. That's going to be our first spot for tonight. Exodus chapter 3. And our first question. Is a question of adequacy. I think one of our strongest temptations as Christians is to feel like we're not enough personally, or we're not good enough, whether it's, you know, we don't see ourselves as holy and righteous as we think we should be. We, we see ourselves struggling or just skilled enough, for instance, to, to give us to do something maybe God has given us to do. And so a great place to go for an example of this is a guy named Moses. So we think of Moses with all of these massive events in the Old Testament of being this great man of faith, of standing there at the parting of the Red Sea, at turning, you know, smiting the rock and having the speaking of the rock and having the waterfall and, and come out of it and all, all these great and mighty things, leading battles and triumphing over God's enemies. But right at the start 
of Moses' story, just a couple chapters in, we get a lot of doubts expressed. We get a lot of fears expressed. And it's one of those things that makes these characters come alive, I think, makes them a lot more real. Because we can put Bible characters on a pedestal. We can forget sometimes that they struggle like we do, that they have some of the same problems we do and the same concerns and cares and worries that we do. So let's get reminded of some of that. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 and verses 7. We'll start in verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, if this had been asked earlier in Moses' life, Moses would have been raring and ready to go. Because before, he took on the job of stopping an Egyptian and killing an Egyptian from salting an Israelite. This is one reason why he's where he is right now, right? He had to run away. He had to get out of there. But he was raring to take action. But now he's had all these years out taking care of flocks by himself, enough time to let those fears and concerns and worries build. And so to this great task, to this great mission, Moses says in verse 11, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. So he tells him, not only am I going to do this with you, Moses, I'm going to bring you right back to this spot here on this mountain. And that's when you'll know you can do this. And I'm with you. Moses got questions in verse 13. And Moses said unto God, behold, when I come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So right away, we get two questions here from Moses. First of all, this, who am I? Who am I to to even do this? And then basically, what proof can I give the people when I come to tell them that I'm supposed to do this? What can I, what sign or what symbol can I give them? And so God answers it with his famous, I am statement. And right away, go straight to the source of Moses' arguments here. Now remember, Moses, again, is here because of his personal failure, because he killed a guy in Egypt and had to run for it. So he was in Pharaoh's household. He had it as good as you could possibly get it, but he's had all these years out in exile because of his personal failure. So he's got this fear within him, feels inadequate, but God reminds him right away in verse 14 there, I am that I am. And by calling himself that, he leaves it open-ended. So like, if you hear something like that, the natural question, follow-up question, is to say, you are what? I am. You know? And that's the answer. I am. I am everything. You could possibly need. You could possibly want out of this mission here. Everything that is required to get this job done, I am. And that goes back to all we know about God, right? All powerful, all knowing, all loving, all merciful, this great and glorious God that's with us. And if we really think about it, this right away leads to humility 
for us. Amen. Because that's who we're dealing with here, the one who is everything, and the one who is all-powerful, the one who is bigger than we can even imagine. And that can actually lead to more of this. Okay, you are everything, but I am just this human. I am frail. I fall apart pretty easily, fall apart easier than I used to, you know. And Moses gives, he'll go through this whole laundry list of excuses until finally he just asks God directly, just please send somebody else, just send anybody else. And God actually gets angry at him at that point in the conversation because of just one excuse after another here. But it can lead to a possible trap of more of this. But that's where God says, not only should this cause humility, but it should be a source of courage. Because, yeah, we are frail and we are human, but our courage comes from him. He tells Moses, I am all these things, more than you could ever dream of, and I will be with you every step of the way, every step of the possible way here. So one of the best ways of dealing with inadequacy and concerns or worries about being good enough or usable or anything is to admit right away that we are going to fail. We're going to trip up. Right? That's, that's what will happen. Even if somebody goes their entire life and makes billions of dollars and has 50 cars sitting in the garage without God in the end, they still fail. So it still leads to the same place of failure. So take it in, breathe that, breathe that air, admit that you are going to fail. And that's why God has to tell him right away. It's okay because I've got this. I'm the one holding you up instead. Yes, we're going to fail, but with him, we can succeed in whatever it is that he gives us to do. And that makes all the difference. We get all sorts of reminders throughout the rest of scripture here. Um, and again, it's one of those things where it would take us a long time if we read everything. But I'll pick out a couple here real quick and just read them. No need to turn to them or anything. But we get the reminder in Joshua 1.9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. And he reminds us again in the New Testament about always being with us, never leaving us, never forsaking us. We have that famous verse two in Philippians 4.13, where he tells us, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Because, again, we're relying on him. So our answer for this question of inadequacy or this question of adequacy is this here. Because it's not on us. It doesn't depend on us. Our salvation certainly doesn't depend on us because there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. But the job he gives us to do, the life he gives us to live, it all is through his strength all through his power, all through his ability. And we get another phrase that's, that's used in Nehemiah, where the people you know, are fresh out of their own exile, and they're hearing the word of God, and many of them just hadn't heard it before, and now they're realizing their responsibilities and their inadequacies, and it's bringing them to tears, it's making them sad, it's moving them. And Nehemiah reminds them to cheer up, to take courage. He tells them the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that word for strength is basically a stronghold, a fortress you can go to. So when we go to that fortress, we're essentially hiding behind him, <laughs> which is the best place to possibly be. And that's where we get our strength. But it's interesting I think that it says the joy of the Lord is what our strength is because one of the easiest targets for these kind of questions is joy. 
right? When you feel inadequate for something, what does it do? It makes you depressed, makes you worry, it gets you down. And that's where we lose that strength. We step back outside of the fortress that we're supposed to be protected by because we've let that joy go away. So Satan loves to hit that over and over and over to try to knock us out of that strength. Well, let's go to Romans 8. We read these verses a fair amount. That's because they're so good. Romans 8. They're famous for a reason. So we go to Romans 8. And in the middle of the chapter, or toward the end of the chapter, actually, we get this historical picture of how God works in lives and that he will fulfill the purpose that he's after. But keeping this in mind, Paul wants to encourage the Romans reading here. So he says in verse 31, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He has spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So again, who does this depend on? Us. Not us. Yeah, depends on God. Depends on Christ, who has already made this sacrifice for us and has already gotten this victory. So what's it lead to? What's it result in? Let's see in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we get into that castle, we get into that fortress, and these things aren't going to drag us out of there. They aren't going to take us out of there because nothing is more powerful than him. Nothing can overcome him. But we get that, um, that saying again here in verse 31, that question that's asked, if God be for us, who can be against us? goes back to our answer for the question of adequacy, for our worries about adequacy. If God calls us to it, if God wants us wants to use us to do it, if God just puts us into this life we have, we can do it because of this. And because of this alone, it's the only thing that can keep us going. We've looked at this in Ephesians Somewhat too. I won't read those verses right now, but in our Sunday school study, we've looked at um, Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter one, right after he gives them another history lesson again about how God has been working since even before time began in their lives and has brought them to this place where they have trusted in Christ, has made this gift available to them, and how he's taken away this separation that they, there used to be between us and God. But he tells them that, or wants them to know, rather, in their, as they pray for other people, that they pray for this realization, this knowledge of the power that's backing them up. And it's the same power, he says, that raised Christ from the dead. Um, one point we made with Sunday school was that we get kind of bogged down in practical prayers a lot, which are, are fine to pray, like the, the basics, like good health for people, um, you know, a great smooth week for people, all those kind of things. But Paul wants us to flip our thinking on it. He wants us to lead off with the spiritual. And that means praying things like, Lord, help them know how great you are. Help them to see how big you are. Help them to have a full picture of that. Because if we understand that, then a lot of the rest of that practical stuff falls into place. And even when it doesn't, and there are continuing problems or concerns that helps us through it, remembering this I am statement, remembering who's there. But he says the whole power that backing this up is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and gave him victory over everything, which is what he says here in Romans 8, too. I mean, these aren't weak words. You know, these are as strong as you can get. We're already more than conquerors. We have this victory. And then that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So Paul's not playing around. He's being clear about it. So in this question of adequacy, our adequacy 
comes from him being everything. All right, second question. So we get a question of recognition. So let's go to Luke chapter 9. A question of recognition or a question of realization. Luke chapter 9. And we go to verse 18 when we're there. So Luke 9, 18. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, whom say the people that I am? So this time, the question is going to come from Christ directly. Usually these chapters are full of people asking him questions. And sometimes he flips the script, and there's this, this is one of those occasions. Verse 19. They answering said, some say you're John the Baptist, but some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. So he drills further down into it here. Verse 20. He said unto them, but whom say you that I am? And Peter answering said, the Christ of God. Here's our question from this. Who do we say Jesus is? It's a good check sometimes, I think, because we get used to thinking about him as, you know, the great teacher, the, the friend of all. Um, and he is. He's, he's all of these things. Peter's answer gets right to the point. Peter answering said, the Christ of God. And they had just seen... This is coming off the heels of a really cool miracle where he feeds this group of 5,000 just men, in addition, all these thousands of women and children. With his five loaves and two fishes, he shows them that he can create something out of pretty much nothing, that he is God, that he's backed up his power, that he says he has. And so he asks them that question, and he does. Initially, he gets all sorts of answers. Like, people aren't quite sure what to make of him, and this is still true Today, people still have a hard time knowing what to make of Jesus. And a lot of times they boil him down to just the good teacher. You know, just a person who said some nice things, told us to be kind to each other and love one another. And that's what he did. And that's what we need to, that's what we need to follow. But the Christian writer C.S. Lewis made a great point about that when he said he didn't give us the option for that because if Jesus is claiming to be the Christ of God, which he tells them here, you know, this is, this is the right thing. If he's claiming to be that and he's not that, then he is a massive liar on a huge scale. So he doesn't leave the option for us just to call him a good man because he's making a very bold and very specific claim here about who he is. The son of God, the Messiah, the savior of the world. And we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school um, last week, too, just kind of uh, the condition of the world and how it can be harder in a lot of ways to be a Christian now than it used to be and how there's kind of less knowledge, it seems like, you know, of the Bible to begin with. Like people used to at least have a little bit of knowledge about like who David and Goliath were, all that kind of stuff. And maybe people have heard about him now. Maybe they haven't. But there's not there's not a lot of it. To tell you the truth. I think for the church, it's a better world to be in because there's not that there's not as much of that cultural Christianity anymore that makes people who aren't saved think they're OK, you know, because it's if they're out there thinking, well, OK, I keep all these rules. I'm kind to people. The, the famous, the most famous one is I haven't killed anybody. Right. That's always the big one. I haven't killed anybody. So I'm good. I'm fine. And I'm loving people, right? That's what Jesus said to do. I'm, I'm out there. I'm feeding the poor. I'm taking care of my friends. I'm doing all these acts of charity. I'm giving to all these places. I'm good. And 
when there's a cultural Christianity, it's, it's easy for people to hide behind that and end up lost forever because they forget about this whole thing about him being the Savior, about being what he said he was, about being the Christ. And so he asks us that question as a self-examination question, and I do. I think it's a lot better in a sense. It's not a lot more fun, and it's not a lot more pleasant sometimes, but I think it's better to have an honest world in that sense where you, people, you know where people stand on this sort of thing. And it's a lot less easy for people to kind of hide behind that wrong image of Jesus. But he gives that question then, and he still gives it today. Because no matter who you are, what walk of life you come from, that's the question you got to answer. And everybody's got to answer it. Everybody's got to decide, okay, who is this guy? Either he's a fake made up character, some will say, and I'll go on with my life. Either he's a good teacher, I'll go on with my life. No matter what your answer is, you have to answer that question. It's probably the biggest question. And if he is the Christ, then that means certain things for us. You know, the ability to be saved, to be right with God, the ability to live with God forever, the ability to have that strength of God that we talked about in the first question. But it requires certain things of us, too. Like, we have to respond to that. We have to decide to put our trust in him or not put our trust in him, decide if we're going to follow him or not. So it requires certain things. So let's go to Matthew 11, too. Bounce over there. Matthew chapter 11. And we'll start in verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So even John the Baptist, this great man of faith, has questions. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So here's what he tells us to do. Trust what you know. When we have our own questions, Sometimes about who Jesus is, when doubts come up, when Satan tries to throw those things our way, tries to get us off track or trick us, what do we know about Jesus? He gives a whole bunch of examples of things that John has seen, has heard of, about all these great miracles, and even the dead being raised, all these things that only God can do to confirm that he is the Messiah, to prove that he's the Messiah. So when we have our own questions about who he is, trust what you know. You don't have to give, you don't have to write a 20-page paper on all the proofs for Jesus in the world, and here's how science and archaeology and all these things, I mean, that stuff's interesting. But what do you know? You know he saved you. You know what he's doing in your life, what he's done in your life. You know he changed your heart. You know that he carries you day by day. You know a lot about it, even if you don't, again, have to you know, write down all these technical explanations for it. Christians get bogged down about that, too. i got to have the 50 arguments for why God exists, and I have to be able to prove to every scientist out there, you know, I have to be able to argue with, people in a lab and show them all, all these things work together. But that's it's not what you have to do. Tell them what you know. Tell them what you've experienced. And it's the realness of it. It's the genuineness of it that makes the most impact on people. It always has been. It always will be. There's no better, no better light than that. Uh, there's a story in John chapter 9. So we won't go there for the sake of time. But there's a story about a man born blind. Jesus gives him sight. And then much of the rest of the chapter is people questioning him on exactly what happened. The religious leaders, because they don't want to hear 
that this thing happened, especially on the Sabbath day. They bring in his parents. They're, they're doing all sorts of things. They're asking everybody, what happened? How can this guy see again? Can, was he blind in the first place? They go to that whole thing. And he gives them a great statement. And he, at that point, even hasn't figured out entirely who Jesus is and what just happened to him. The only thing he tells them is, once I was blind, now I can see. That's it. That's the, that's the truth. And it's the same thing for us. That's what it boils down to. Once I was blind, now I can see. And that's who Jesus is to us. All right, final one. We got a question of adequacy, a question of recognition. And we'll go tonight with a question of distraction. So I read from Psalm 73 for the morning service. It was one of my favorite places to go. Let's go to another one of my favorite places because I'm teaching. I can go to my favorite places. (laughs) John 21. John chapter 21. I love John chapter 21 because John chapter 20 is the resurrection chapter. All this epic stuff happens and even ends. Let's just read it. Verses 30 and 31 of chapter 20. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. If that's a movie, that's where the music gets really loud and they roll to credits and the book of John is over, right? Except we get John 21. And it's mostly a story about the disciples fishing and hanging out on shore with Jesus. It's like a post credit scene in like a Marvel movie or something. Mm. It's just the action's over, everything's come to an end, and now here's this thing that happens over here. And it's a conversation between Jesus and mostly Peter. So he talks to Peter in the chapter and restores that relationship after Peter had denied him three times. He ends up getting Peter to say that Peter loves him three times and tells him to follow him. That's his, that's his direct command. Follow me, take care of my sheep because I'm leaving. I'm on the way up. So take care of my followers for me. But let's look here in verse 18. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. When thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. So he tells Peter, when you're young, you take care of yourself, and you go where you want to go. But when you're old, eventually, people are going to take you where you don't want to go. And that's going to be his death and his way that he gets to glorify God. Um, The Christian tradition in the church is that Peter was crucified and crucified upside down because he said he didn't want to be crucified the same way that that Jesus was. It's the tradition um, may be true. Who knows, but it's the story that's been, that's been passed down. And if it's true, it fits with, with what's said here. So he gives him this grand statement, shows him a, a little glimpse into his future. And then basically tells him to trust him for the rest, right? He tells him the story and then says, follow me. So Peter, as Peter likes to do, turns around and he starts looking around. The disciples really easily get distracted in in the gospel, sometimes for bad reasons, sometimes just for good and natural reasons. And I think this is one of these. I think Peter's saying, okay, you're telling me what's going to happen to me. But he looks around and it says in verse 20, then Peter turning about, See the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper. And so this is John here, the author of the book they've talked about. And said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? So that's what happened when they were eating the Passover there before Jesus was betrayed. Verse 21, Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And I don't blame Peter much for that because it's kind of a natural, it's a natural question. All right, that's what's going to happen to me. What about that guy? Over here. So I like John. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to John? What's John going to do? And so Jesus gives him five verses of exactly what's going to happen to John, right? Step by step. No. Let's see what he tells him. John 22. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry, do I come? What is that to you? Follow me. Basically, if I want that guy around as long as, you know, as long as it takes for me to come back, 
what does that matter to you? Because I've given you your mission and your assignment. Follow me. And so exactly what you would expect happens in verse 23. Then went the saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. So they're like, all right, that guy's going to live forever, apparently, until Jesus comes back. And that's their, that's their takeaway from this. And I like how John, writing the book, adds in this like defense almost here for a second. It says, yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And he just repeats it. <laughs> this is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. It's almost like John's heard this a bunch in the church. And now he gets a chance in this letter to refute it and to say, look, that's not what he said. Here's what he said. Actually pay attention to what he said. So on this question of distraction, eyes on the job. Every one of us has something to do in God's plan, which is really cool. The fact that this all-powerful I am asks us to do anything, wants us to do anything for him at all. And each one of us has a role. Each one of us has different gifts, different strengths. I'm really glad Richard knows how to do electrical things because I would fry myself in a second if I had to do something like that. But we all have different skills, different abilities, and that's one of the great things about the church. It's as diverse as you can get, and it's really cool. And he brings all these different people together and uses them for his purposes and his abilities and his, and his mission, uses their abilities for his mission. And he wants us to stay focused on that instead of getting pulled off to, okay, well, what about this person over here? And even just natural stuff, like that person's really concerned and we get down and we get worried about that, which we can because we need to pray for people when that kind of thing happens. But it shouldn't stop us from, like we said this morning, with this whole idea of questions, moving forward, living for him, doing what we're supposed to do, what we've been called to do. Whether it's the deep questions of what's wrong with the world, why is it falling apart, why is there sickness and illness and all these sort of things. Whether it's just the natural questions, like why didn't I get a really good parking spot today? I'm really mad about it. Move on. Follow him. Seek his will. Seek what he wants us to do. Because that's his answer here. He avoids the question entirely in the sense of what Peter's looking for. He just blows it off. He tells him, you know what matters? Following me is what matters. And we get distracted by all sorts of things. We get off track so easily. We are like, like, shiny, like shiny objects get us. If something's flashing in the distance, it pulls our attention from us really easily. One of the biggest things we get distracted by is looking for signs. Right? We want to see signs. We want to hear this big booming voice in the sky, and it would be so much easier if that big booming voice would just tell us what to do in certain situations or how to handle certain things that, that come up. But over and over in the New Testament, here and in plenty of other spots, Jesus says, don't worry about any of that stuff. Jesus actually gets aggravated when people ask him for signs constantly. And he tells them, I've already given you signs. <laughs> He's like, what are you going to do with what I've shown you? And this is our sign. This is what he's given us. So what do we do with that? What do we do with the knowledge, again, that we already have up here about who he is, about who he is there, about what he's done? Don't get distracted by that because in the end, those questions can replace faith, right? That's really why we want to sign is so we can feel extra sure about something. In the Bible, people get signs. Sometimes they ask for another one right on top of it. Like, can you do this again? Oh, wait, can you do this a third time just to make sure? And it replaces faith for us. So with these questions, with these doubts, don't get distracted. Instead, focus on what he wants us to do and what he's called us to do. Keep following. Keep moving forward. Um, we might actually want to snag Derek real quick because he's going to lead the final song. And I might want to lead the final song. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it doesn't have a piano either, so it's, it's no good. Um, and the other famous story about this is the Mary and Martha story, right? So when Jesus is at the house of these people that he loves, Mary and Martha, and Martha's all worried about the serving, about taking care of everything, the household chores, and Mary's just listening to Jesus. 
and Martha complains to Jesus about this. And Jesus, again, basically tells her this, follow me, focus on me, eyes forward on the job here. There's time for all that kind of stuff. But do what you need to do. Priorities first, focus on him. And I think in the end, all of this comes back to the Great Commission. So like Moses, like Peter and John, he's given us our job. So we have a job in the church and we have a job outside of the church to reach people, to be that light in the world. And all these questions can stop us from being that light sometimes, can make us put that light out, can keep it from shining, because that's what a light's supposed to do, is shine. And if a light's got a bunch of doubts, it's just going to flicker off to the side and it's not going to do anything. But when he gives them that great commission, he says, go out and preach this message. Go out and preach the gospel to all the world. He ends it by saying, remember, I'm with you all the time. I'm with you always. So this whole show is done and then beyond that. He's with us. His presence is with us. His strength is with us. His power is with us. And ultimately, he is the answer to all these questions. All right. So questions and answers. Just a few of a whole lot of examples in the Bible. All right. Any thoughts? Any questions? Mostly answers, hopefully, as we, as we wrap up here.